So I saw a lot of people on Sunday night and even into Monday talking about WWE Hell in a Cell and saying that, you know, this is part of a recent trend with the company of really lackluster build up to their premium live events and then over delivering once you actually get to the show. And admittedly, if you're one of those folks that literally only cares about the in-ring action and only cares about the moves, that's probably true. If that's your style of wrestling, that's what you prefer. So this crap probably appeals to you. But to me, I think it does fit with a larger WWE trend that is different than that. And that is bad decisions, pointless gimmick pay-per-views, and just really, really stupid things, stupid booking decisions. That's what I look at this as. There were good matches on the show, absolutely. And I'll talk about them, but yeah. The crowd was great, it felt like, throughout the night. Like, that was cool. It's always nice when you've got a hot crowd, but damn. I don't know. Like, experience in person probably is vastly different than the experience watching at home. It's just my thought always when it comes to wrestling. Like, I look at this Raw Women's Championship triple threat match. Asuka, Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair. If you're going to look at any matches on this card that feels like they could have justified having a Hell in a Cell match, it probably would have been a Becky Lynch and Bianca one-on-one like blow-off match, right? There's enough story, there's enough history there. You could actually justify the gimmick for the match, the gimmick for the damn pay-per-view for their story. But of course, they wedge Asuka in here. They wedge Becky Lynch in here. You've got this fucking triple threat. I typically hate triple threats because I think it's really stupid writing. It's really stupid booking. And I think it makes for some stupid, lazy-ass matches. So why couldn't this just been a one-on-one match in the Hell in a Cell? Or, if you were going to go there and you insisted on doing this damn triple threat, fine. You know what? Do that. Then make the damn triple threat a Hell in a Cell match, especially if you're going to have it kick off the damn show. Is that they're going to have it kick off the show and then not be a Hell in a Cell? To me, just felt really stupid. This match was pretty damn good. It was a shame that it had to open the show. It was a shame that these ladies didn't get the credit for getting a Hell in a Cell match, and they deserved that, I felt. Like, if you're going to do that, then go all the way. Just really dumb to me. So, match, like I said, was pretty good. I enjoyed the match itself. It's when you think about anything at all pertaining to it, it just aggravates me. Like, almost an MVP versus Bobby Lashley. This is a two-on-one handicap match. The MVP vignette where they were having them kind of flow on Bobby, spit them hot fire bars, you know, like, cool. That was good stuff. But when you look at this match, you really couldn't have Amos win a handicap match? I realize it's against Bobby Lashley, the battle toe, but holy Christ. Like, you're trying to take Black Kyle Lee, I thought, and make something out of him. And you don't even have him win the two-on-one handicap match here? I mean, the crowd's really behind Bobby Lashley, and that's cool and all, but what the hell are you doing? Oh, you're going to tease Bobby Lashley going after the title. Well, you know what? <laughs> I'm kind of digging the Roman Reigns thing of, yeah, I took like a three-month summer break from pay-per-views. Fuck that shit. That's right. Acknowledge him. Those young lions got to take care of themselves. <laughs> Breakfast club rules, bitches. A uh, Kevin Owens versus Ezekiel, this is so stupid. It has no business working, and yet because it involves two really good, talented performers like Kevin Owens and Ezekiel, it really, really does work. It's a shame that you have to waste both of these talents in a story like this, in a match like this, but again, because they're damn good, they're really damn good, and they have good chemistry working off of each other, this shit works. This is fun. But what's the point of doing all this just to have Ezekiel lose? I mean, I'm just saying. Now, maybe you could say, well, you just had Kevin Owens wrestle Stone Cold Steve Austin in the main event of WrestleMania. You can't exactly just not have him do something and win. Like, I get that, but just odd to me. But it's fun. Like, it's way more fun, way more enjoyable than it has any business being, frankly. It should be one of those things that we look at and say, this is an incredibly dumbass, stupid idea. And sometimes some of the best characters, some of the best ideas in wrestling are those ones that toe the lines of being really dumbass, stupid ideas. Example, The Undertaker. That really towed the line, especially at first, of being too hokey, cartoony, and fake. Towed the line, but didn't tip over 
and to become one of the great gimmicks in wrestling history. Uh, the six-person intergender tag, AJ Styles, Finn Balor, Liv Morgan versus The Judgment Day. I know some of you are probably drooling over Rhea Ripley wearing basically what were booty shorts, and I understand that, and you shall have your moment. Um, but the match was cool. Edge's group wins. You know, to me, I was thinking after I watched this paper, we finished watching it on Monday, I said, you know, with Edge in charge, something feels off here. You have Edge there in charge, but the crowd really doesn't want to hate on Edge. But they also understand, I think, the fans that you're trying to elevate others, utilizing Edge's profile to do so. And that makes sense. That's how you should be using somebody like an Edge, potentially. But the crowd really doesn't want to boo Edge. And furthermore, they probably need some guys that you can really get behind. You need some guys with the star power on the babyface side on the top. And you got him in charge of this faction that basically is a mid-card faction. So if you're going to continue to have Edge in charge, then you need to start giving the group belts up to and including giving Edge a world title. Well, instead, apparently they fixed that on Raw Monday night, and now Finn Balor's in charge of the damn group, and there they go to the mid-card, where the hell they were destined all along. So just really weird. Like, it's one of those things you could say, well, that's a surprise, and you didn't see it coming, and that could be cool, but sometimes you also don't see it coming because it's kind of dumb. You know what I mean? Again, toes align sometimes. A Madcap Moss versus Happy Corbin. I guess Madcap Moss is going to get a bit of a push now. Certainly comes out of this match doing well. But the only thing we honestly give a fuck about here is please, 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 for the love of God and humanity, bring back broke Baron Corbin. And you have such a natural transition to be able to do that. Just before this match, he was so foolishly confident in himself that he said he didn't need health insurance. So now that Madcap Moss injured him, he doesn't have health insurance. God knows the WWE doesn't provide it because he's not an employee. He's an independent contractor. So he's got massive medical debt. Combine that with the fact that he refinanced his student loans through a private lender meaning that he wouldn't be eligible for any massive student loan forgiveness by President Biden. So the medical debt combined with the student loan debt, everybody can fucking relate to that. And Saddam broke Baron Corbin is back. Let the road to WrestleMania 39 redemption begin, bitches. If it doesn't lead to this, then fuck it. Everything else about Happy Corbin is stupid. This is a chance to get it right. This is a chance to rectify a previous wrong. Do it, damn it. Because what he was doing with that character was some of the best work we've seen out of somebody investing totally into a gimmick and a shtick in a long, long time. It's certainly the best work of his fucking career by a country mile. We want broke bum-ass Baron Corbin back, bitches. Uh, the United States Championship. <laughs> oh, this is phenomenal. Mustafa Ali versus Austin Theory. The crowd was incredibly hot for the hometown guy, Mustafa Ali. And it's so easy to find an excuse to have the hometown guy win, especially a guy that's been bitching and pissing and moaning. It's like the one really good talent that Mustafa Ali actually has, which is pissing and moaning about his place on the card. It's the one thing he does well is bitch. Um, so many justifiable reasons you could have the hometown guy win here. But Vince takes a look at that and says, <laughs> uh -uh. Let's have Fury go over. Clean. That's such good shit. Hometown heroes should always lose. <laughs> he had the crowd was so hot for Mustafa Ali, and he had Austin Theory go over clean. <laughs> Let the build up to his match against Cena begin, huh? Did I hear Corey Graves at one point talk about how uh, Austin Theory was accused of something? You know, like, be careful when you throw out the word accused alongside Austin Theory. That might not go so well, Corey Graves. That's all I'm fucking saying. Now, was there another match on this card? I don't even fucking remember. There might have been. But if there was, honestly, frankly, it's not important enough to talk about. The thing that I think everybody's really talking about coming out of this pay-per-view is Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins inside of Hell in a Cell. <laughs> Cody got injured. Karma's a bitch. And so is he. <laughs> well, I can't believe you would say that about somebody getting injured or hurt. All I said was, karma's a bitch, and so is he. Now, he is a tough son of a bitch, but a bitch nonetheless. 
And as you might imagine, like I have a lot of concerns and a lot of problems with how the way this main event played out. Now, I could certainly envision, anticipate, like Cody Rhodes with the torn pack, and it was torn off the bone, as we heard so many times throughout the match. Like, just even the mere sight, when he took off the coat and you saw all the bruising, you're like, man, that's the second worst tattoo he's got. Oh, wait, that's not a tattoo? That's the fucking bruising from the torn back? Holy shit. That looks gnarly. That looks horrible. And I get the sense that he probably was at a point where you could shoot him up a corner zone or something and honestly, he's not going to feel much pain and he's not going to cause more damage because if he's already torn it off the bone, like I get that. Like I don't doubt that he has a, has a desire to go out there and perform in front of the fans. I wouldn't say that he doesn't have that. He certainly does because you have to, to do that kind of shit. I mean, the dude nutted up in this spot and in this moment. But God damn, this sends a lot of bad messages here on a variety of different levels for me. A lot of people are going to talk about how great the storytelling was here and how great these two worked off of each other and what a masterpiece this was for Seth Rollins. Well, let's talk about the Seth Rollins character. He had already lost to Cody Rhodes twice. And now, when he's facing an opponent who is clearly fucking injured, not hurt, like, hurt is something like, hey, I sprained my ankle. You know, for some of you, you twisted your fallopian tube slightly. Uh, you strained a hamstring or a quadricep or a groin muscle. You know, something like that. That's hurt. But injured is something like, I tore a muscle from the bone. I broke a bone in a part of my body. I should not be doing my athletic craft. Cody Rhodes was injured. And Seth Rollins still couldn't fucking beat him. Not only did you basically make him Cody Cena, and that's what the fuck this came across as, you made Seth Rollins look like a jackass. And it's ridiculous that you sit there and have him lose this match, facing off an injured opponent, having the match go long as it damn did, and knowing that you're probably going to have to have Cody Rhodes off of television anyways for several fucking months. Like, that's stupid. No. That's dumb. And all the shit that some of you used to say about Super Cena and blah, blah, blah. If you're not going to shit on this now, then you're a bunch of fucking hypocrites. And even the whole notion here of the way this match plays out. Some of you are saying, well, why did you need a fourth match? Like, this was designed to be the third one. This is the trilogy. Why did it have to be the end of it? These guys clearly have great, fantastic chemistry together. Why not have an excuse for a return match? Like, that's a very big lost art today in wrestling, in my opinion. Or sports entertainment, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Why not have Seth Rollins beat the guy that's clearly fucking injured? And send him off for a few months. And you come back and maybe Seth Rollins has one of the world titles. And maybe you have Cody win the goddamn Royal Rumble. And those two have a title match at WrestleMania. And now maybe you can still get there, but goddamn, you could have had even more incentive for that. You could have the people foaming at the mouth for that shit in several months. And you would have helped the Seth Rollins character at this point. Why in the fuck would I take the Seth Rollins character seriously? Almost every goddamn big match that he's in, he fucking loses. That's stupid. And to have a clearly injured Cody Rhodes win his third consecutive match over Seth Rollins kind of makes the whole goddamn thing stupid to your point of, well, they had to sit there and build up and establish Cody Rhodes. You had him win at WrestleMania. You could have at least given Seth Rollins a second fucking match. You did not need to pound Cody that much. If you felt like you needed to pound Cody that much, then maybe that is more of a validation of the shit that I've talked about with him over the years of just how much a goddamn mid-carder he really is. And you run the risk now because of going to this extreme to force Cody Rhodes as a babyface down everybody's throat, which is clearly what he fucking wants because he doesn't like to be booed. He likes to be cheered because that's what inconsiderate, or not inconsiderate, excuse me, insecure douchebags do. I still fundamentally believe there was at least a small part of him that said, I can go back to WWE and be a hero and AEW, I'm hated. That matters to him. Ugh. Like he was a tough ass son of a bitch. No question for this performance. But to sit there and say this makes him a babyface, no, this makes him the fucking obstacle. What do you what do you have to do to beat Cody Rhodes now? 
He's got to sit there and tear two pectoral muscles from the bone. He's got to tear a tricep or a bicep muscle too. I mean, Seth Rollins, in terms of the scope of WWE, is no bitch ass. So the dude that cashed in money in the bank at WrestleMania. This is a dude that beat Brock Lesnar multiple times. And he can't beat Cody Rhodes once, and especially when he's injured? Come the fuck on! That's stupid! So yeah, as I was sitting there watching this, and so many of you were captivated and thought this was epic storytelling, I thought this was really bad. And I thought it sends a bad message too. Because now you're basically running the risk of setting a tone of saying, hey, you might feel like you're hurt, but we're going to encourage you and nudge you like, hey, look at what Cody did with this. You should probably do the same. And they're going to say, WWE, oh, we won't do that like it was his choice. Like, where the fuck are the adults here to say, no, you need to get this taken care of. No, this is irresponsible. No, we're not going to take the risk. No, we don't want that visual. We don't want that as part of our presentation. Who's running the fucking show here? Now, granted, like I said, he probably couldn't have done that much more damage to the pec that was already torn. But as part of trying to compensate for that injury, could he have run the risk of having a more serious or similar level of serious injury somewhere else on his body? Absolutely. So it's not even just the risk of that inherent injury itself. It's the other things that you could put at risk. You know, and this is a guy that you invested a lot in and you want to get a lot out of over the past few years. Was it really that important to throw him on this filler goddamn pay-per-view that really didn't matter that much? No. You could have found an excuse. You could have found a reason. So, yeah, I did was not a fan of this main event at all. Rage at me at the comments all you want. But I think it sends a shitty message. I think the booking decision behind it was all types of fucking moronic. I think it makes Seth Rollins' character look like a bitch ass and it runs the risk of going too far with booking Cody Rhodes as a big time baby face. So I don't think any of it was fucking good. Enjoy it if you must. Enjoy it if you want. That's fine. I won't hate on you for it here. But just my opinion, my opinion, I thought it was the shits for all the reasons that I've already stated here. But you can go ahead and let me know what you thought about Hell in a Cell 2022. Let me know how much you hate me for my thoughts on the main event that surely a lot of you thought was a freaking epic. And Dave Meltzer better give that match a minimum of five stars. I wonder how many stars he is going to give it. That piece of crap. As you know, if that was in fucking New Japan at the Tokyo Dome or if it was in an AEW show, it would be a minimum six star match. How oh, the fuck you have a six star, six plus star match on the five star scale? I like, just shows how stupid Meltzer is and how stupid people are for taking his wrestling opinions seriously in 2022. Anyways, that's Hell in a Cell. There was some good stuff on here, but I thought a lot of the booking decisions, frankly, were WWE of old. They sucked.